Shadow Slave by Guilty Three. Chapter 64, Pursued by Demons. Let me guess. You want to kill it. Nephi's continued to stare at him with her usual unreadable expression. After a while, Sonny chuckled and shook his head in disbelief. You really are crazy. That's, that's an awakened demon we're talking about, remember? Have you forgotten that we're just sleepers? Then he frowned and scratched his head. W, wait a second. I feel like we already had this conversation before. Doesn't it feel familiar? Cassie glanced at the two of them and politely cleared her throat. Actually, you had said pretty much the exact same thing right before we decided to attack that first carapace centurion. Sunny beamed. Yes. Exactly. And how did that end up? I almost got killed. Nephi shrugged indifferently. You survived, didn't you? He froze with his mouth open, too flabbergasted by the sheer audacity of her remark to answer immediately. A few seconds later, Sonny was finally able to speak again. That's not the point. Cassie gently touched her friend on the shoulder and whispered. Neff. That's not a very nice thing to say. Changing Star's face flushed a little. Glancing aside, she hesitated and said, What I meant to say is, uh, we've won in the end, didn't we? It was a risk we had to take, and it paid off. We've grown stronger since then. Sonny had a feeling that the fight against the carapace demon was already inevitable, but couldn't bring himself to stop protesting, solely out of principle. But that thing. It's huge. It's so tall you won't even be able to poke it with your sword. What are we going to do, asked the bastard politely to lower itself to our level. Neff frowned and looked at him with displeasure. It's just an. Awakened demon, I know. Sonny sighed and shook his head again, feeling like he was talking to a stone wall. Changing Star's mind was still a mystery to him. He had realized a long time ago that there was a deep dark well hidden behind her seemingly radiant exterior. No one pushed themselves that hard, endured that much, went that far unless they were being pursued by demons of their own, he knew that from experience. And judging by how far ahead of everyone he had ever known Nephi's was, her personal demons were especially dreadful. Much more dreadful than the terrifying carapace demon, at least. But although Sonny understood that she was running from something, he had no idea what destination she was so desperate to reach. Just why was she so hellbent on finding that damned human castle, even more so than Sonny himself? His burning desire to come back to reality and rip all the rewards that the world owed him was so intense that it would frighten most people to death. There were very few things that he wasn't willing to do to achieve his dream. However, it only had meaning for as long as he stayed alive. Nephi's, on the other hand, seemed to pursue a goal that held more meaning than her life. Why else would she be so willing to risk it? Sonny just couldn't understand that logic. It was irrational and paradoxical. What can be more important than your life? If you die, you won't be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor anyway. He looked Nephi's in the eyes and said, back when we agreed to fight the carapace centurion, we did so because there was no other choice. We were literally stuck on a rock with it. What about now? Don't we have a choice to avoid the ashen barrow? She stared at him for a while and then simply said, that's the only way west. Sonny laughed. That is the truth, I'll give you that. When his laughter died down, he wiped the corner of his eye and said, all right. All right. That makes sense. But believe me when I say it, as the only one who actually saw the carapace demon, we won't be able to defeat it in a fight. Nephi scowled. Your point. Sonny spread his hands. Don't misunderstand. Yes, we can't defeat it. But. A dark smile appeared on his face. That doesn't mean that we can't kill it. Changing Star thought about it, then raised an eyebrow and asked, You have a plan. Sonny shook his head. Not yet, not entirely. Let me sleep on it. However, there's one thing I know for sure. He looked west, remembering the carapace demon's disturbing, bestial face. In the ensuing silence, Cassie turned her head to face him and asked with curiosity, What is it? Sonny blinked. Ah. Oh, yes. It's pretty simple, really. Unlike the scavengers and centurions, that thing appears to be rather intelligent. Which means that it can be deceived. 
They spent another uneventful night inside the dead leviathan's spine. As far as their camps went, this one was probably the safest. There was a certain comfort in being surrounded by walls from all sides, even if they were made out of bone. Sleeping on top of cliffs and coral mounds, just meters away from the surface of the dark sea, exposed to elements, was not very restful. Sunny even entertained the thought of suggesting to Nephi's that they should stay here for a while, a few weeks, or even months if needed. They could slowly explore the surrounding areas, hunt monsters, and grow stronger. Then, after absorbing hundreds of soul shards and shadow fragments, armed with dozens of memories and even a few more echoes, perhaps, they could attack the carapace demon and be more sure of success. However, he quickly realized that it was a bad idea. The forgotten shore was perilous and unpredictable. They were rather successful in conquering its dangers so far, but it was too easy for the situation to change. One moment of bad luck was enough to doom them. One wrong turn, one unfortunate encounter, one more enemy than they were able to handle, and their lives would be over. And that was only in regard to the usual menagerie of abominable horrors they had to fight on a daily basis. The labyrinth hid much more terrifying secrets and existences, not to mention the unimaginable terrors of the deep dark sea. Every additional day they spent here gave a chance for something fatal and unavoidable to happen. Their best hope of survival was to face the carapace demon as soon as possible. Maybe after defeating it, they would finally be able to see the tall walls of the promised castle. Sunny tossed and turned the whole night, thinking about the giant creature and trying to give shape to the nascent seed of the idea of how to kill it. Close to the morning, he was finally able to fall asleep, only to be awakened by Cassie carefully shaking his shoulder half an hour later. Sunny blinked, looking at the blind girl in confusion. What is it? She gestured to Nephi's, asking her to come closer. Then, a little pale, she gathered her courage and said, I had another vision. A vision about the carapace demon. Chapter 65, Lights in the Darkness. Sonny was instantly wide awake. Sitting up, he hurriedly rubbed his eyes and then glanced at the blind girl, ready to listen. Nephi's approached them and sat down, her face barely visible in the dim light of the early dawn. Past or future? Sonny blinked. Right. I should have asked myself. Cassie thought for a bit and then hesitantly answered, past. I think. After a short pause, her expression changed to that of certainty. No, I'm sure of it. Changing star slightly tilted her head. That's good. So, what did you see? Cassie deeply inhaled and fell silent for several seconds, remembering. Her face paled a little, but this time, she was ready to face her fear. I saw the ashen barrow deep at night, enveloped in a raging storm. The winds were bending the branches of the great tree, as if desperate to break them. The island was illuminated by the constant barrage of thundering lightning bolts, with rain falling from the skies like a flood. She paused, catching her breath, and continued, the carapace demon was there, standing in the middle of the storm like an unshakable fortress made of polished steel. Arcs of electricity were dancing between the spikes on his armor, but the demon did not pay it any attention. He was just as Sunny described, prideful, sinister, and terrifying. Cassie closed her eyes. When I looked into his eyes, I felt, a sense of emptiness and corruption. He observed the storm until it began to dissipate. The winds weakened, the rain stopped. The great tree stood unbroken, just as magnificent as it was before. But then, the last bolt of lightning fell from the sky and struck the ground beside it. Sunny was listening to her tale with great attention, hopeful to hear a piece of useful information. So, that monstrosity is not afraid of lightning. Shame. With its metal carapace, I was almost tempted to try and lure it from under the tree during a storm. Apparently, that wouldn't work. Meanwhile, Cassie was ready to carry on, that bolt of lightning could never hurt the carapace demon, let alone the miraculous tree. However, when it hit the ground, it ignited the fallen leaves that covered the ashen barrow's surface. Soon, a large part of the island was engulfed in fire. In the absolute darkness of the night, it shone like a beacon. Sunny perked up, remembering something. Back when the three of them first met at the beginning of their deadly adventure through the dream realm, the girls mentioned that the light he had seen from the giant knight's statue a few nights prior was indeed made by them. However, making that fire had turned out to be a big mistake. At night, 
Any source of light was like a lure for the monsters of the forgotten shore, including the terrifying creatures that lurked in the depths of the dark sea. That's why, ever since, they were careful to never light a fire after sunset, preferring to endure the darkness instead of attracting unknown horrors from beneath the waves. Having a guess of what had happened next in Cassie's vision, he waited for the blind girl to continue. Her voice trembled a little. Before the flames died down, the dark sea surged, and a, a thing crawled out of it, covering almost the entire slope of the ashen barrow with its body. It looked like a, like a mass of bones and rotten flesh connected by black seaweed, with thousands of horrible eyes staring at me hungrily from beneath, coiling tentacles seething as it pushed itself toward the great tree. Her face turned slightly green. Just remembering the abomination made Cassie feel nauseated, but she gritted her teeth and did not stop speaking. That was the most repulsive creature I've ever seen. However, it seemed slow and clumsy, as though being ashore, outside of the black water, was weakening it. The carapace demon did not hesitate to lunge at the creature, completely ignoring the fact that it was at least ten times his size. It was like, like he completely lost his mind, enraged by the intrusion on the island. Nephi suddenly spoke, how did the demon survive? The blind girl hesitated. I. I don't know. I didn't see the battle itself, only its beginning and its end. At the break of dawn, the carapace demon crawled back into the shade of the great tea. He was severely wounded, with several of his legs missing and his sides covered by a spider web of cracks. The fire was gone, and there was no sign of the sea creature anywhere in sight. She paused for a moment and then said in a quiet voice, the most terrible wound was on his chest. The steel armor of the demon was fractured and split apart, revealing the beating heart inside. Rivers of azure blood were flowing from the wound, mixing with the ashen sand. The demon crawled to the base of the tree and laid his broken body between its roots. Cassie sighed. The last thing I saw was the passage of time. I don't know how long it took, but eventually, the carapace demon was able to recover from his wounds. His sides restored themselves, his legs grew back. The fracture on his chest was the last to heal. However, it wasn't healed completely. Hidden from sight, there's still a weakness in his armor. Both Sunny and Nephi's were silent for a long time, thinking. Changing Star was the first to break the silence. So it's not impenetrable after all. Then she looked at Sunny and asked, How's your plan coming along? He blinked, extricating himself from the swarm of thoughts. Glancing at his companions, Sunny smiled. Pretty well. I already had an inkling of how we should proceed, but Cassie's vision gave me additional inspiration. Nephi's raised an eyebrow. Is that so? He gave her a confident nod. Yeah. It's a wild idea, but it might just work. Well, maybe. In any case, it's going to be risky. And we'll have to make some preparations. Both Cassie and Nephi's looked at him expectantly. The blind girl cautiously asked. So, what's your plan? How are we going to deceive the demon? Sonny crossed his arms. It's not very complicated. Actually, I got the idea from that ancient fellow Neff likes to talk about. We're going to build. He took a dramatic pause, and then said with a mysterious smile, a Trojan ass. However, their reaction was not what he had expected. Both girls blinked, then stared at him with complicated expressions. Well, Cassie did not stare, since she was blind, but her face was exactly the same as changing stars. Strange. Eh what now? Sonny scratched the back of his head, somewhat embarrassed, and cleared his throat. Ah, did I use the wrong word? I thought that Odysseus guy built a wooden animal. Ah, uh, ah, uh, donkey. Nephi's raised a hand and put it on her forehead, closing her eyes. Weird. Does she have a headache? Ah, uh, are you all right? She sighed deeply, then said in a flat tone, a horse. It was a horse, the next day, they returned to the place of the battle between the carapace legion and the centipede monsters. A few days earlier, they had lured a carapace centurion here to ambush it, but ended up causing a massive confrontation between the two tribes of nightmare creatures. The carcasses of some of the monsters were still there, buried slightly in the mud. Of course, there was no meat left on their skeletons. The inhabitants of the labyrinth were for the most part carrion eaters, after all. However, the three sleepers were not interested in meat. 
they came for something else. Stopping in front of the centurion's empty shell, cleaned of any flesh by some unknown beasts, he looked at the black and crimson carapace in satisfaction. Nephi's walked over and stood by his side, an unreadable expression on her face. Is this what you wanted? Sonny smiled. Yeah, exactly. I knew that nothing would be insane enough to chew on the chitin, but, in this place, you never know. I wasn't sure about its condition. But the condition was good. In fact, it was perfect. Chapter 66, First Part of the Plan Close to the evening, with the sun tiredly descending toward the horizon, a strange creature walked out of the colorless remains of the labyrinth. If walking was even the right word. Dragging its legs in the sand, the creature somehow floated forward without moving them. It looked like a carapace centurion, or at least a close approximation of one. All the necessary parts were in place. The creature had a black carapace with a menacing crimson pattern on it, a humanoid torso, eight segmented legs and two arms ending with formidable bone scythes. However, all these parts looked mismatched and strange, as though put together by some clumsy sculptor. Additionally, the centurion moved as if it was seriously drunk. The carapace was careening to one side, sometimes scraping against the sand. The torso was swinging back and forth for no apparent reason. The sides were awkwardly lodged behind the creature's back, crossed against each other at a strange angle. At some point, one of them simply dropped to the ground. The centurion stopped and hesitated for a few seconds, as though unsure what to do. Then it left its side arm behind and continued on its way as if nothing had happened. A perceptive observer would have noticed that the creature seemed to possess two shadows. The first shadow was as one would expect, its shape identical to the creature itself. The second one resembled a human. It briefly showed itself from beneath the larger shadow when the centurion abandoned the runaway limb. The human shadow then proceeded to facepalm and shake its head in utter contempt. The whole situation was nothing short of being completely bizarre. But, for better or worse, there was nobody around to notice the weird creature. Unobstructed, it traversed the wasteland, moving in the direction of the ashen barrow. Soon, it was almost at the footstep of the tall hill. The sunset was approaching. The strange centurion plopped on the ground at the base of the ashen barrow and stopped moving completely. Awkward and lopsided, it looked like a parody of the other monster of its kind who had kneeled gracefully at the same spot a few days prior. Additionally, it arrived without a tribute. There was no transcendent soul shard in sight. Added to the disrespectful pose, this transgression was more than enough to get the centurion killed. Perhaps, it was suicidal. On top of the barrow, the carapace demon moved and rose from the ashen sand. His shining armor glistened, reflecting the light of the setting sun. Encased in bright metal, with a crown of horns adorning his head, the demon looked fearsome and sinister. Gazing down, he lingered for a few moments. Two dark scarlet embers ignited in the depths of the demon's eyes. Shifting his terrifying sides, the giant monster walked forward, slowly descending from the hill to face the strange visitor. The ground shook as he approached. However, the bizarre centurion did not even flinch. In fact, it remained completely motionless. The carapace demon stopped some distance away from the suspicious creature. He observed it, clearly understanding that its pathetic appearance might be a trap. The labyrinth was full of unimaginable dangers. Rashly approaching an unknown foe was not something an awakened demon, who possessed his own form of intelligence, would do. At least that was what the three sleepers had assumed. However, they were wrong. Just a second later, the carapace demon lunged forward. Its side flashed through the air, severing the centurion's torso in half. The adamantine chitin was cut apart as though it was made of butter. The upper half of the monster's torso flew off, revealing only emptiness inside. On the other side of the ashen barrow, Sonny, who was running up the slope with all his might, cursed under his breath. That was too soon. He thought that they would have more time. Who knew that the carapace demon would turn out to be such a daredevil? He didn't even hesitate before going all out. With Cassie riding piggyback on his back, Sonny gritted his teeth and tried to run even faster. It was time to switch to plan B. A moment later, the weird centurion's carapace came apart, setting the echo that had been hiding underneath it free. Pushing the pieces of chitin away with its powerful pincers, the scavenger rushed toward the towering demon. It was aiming to duck underneath it and, 
hopefully, mess up the giant's legs. The first part of Sunny's plan was rather simple. They were going to use the remains of a dead carapace centurion to disguise the Echo, which was much smaller in comparison, as one of the officers of the carapace legion. Then, they would send it to the base of the Ashen Barrow to lure the demon away. The three of them were going to circle the hill and hide themselves under the grey sand in advance, then run up the slope into the center of the island as soon as the demon had left. The Echo was supposed to buy them enough time to climb the great tree and conceal themselves in its branches. Then, Sonny would dismiss the Echo, thus finishing the first stage of the plan. He never intended for the scavenger to actually fight the fearsome demon. However, the carapace demon's unusually swift act of aggression had messed up the timing of the whole thing. The decoy was already destroyed, yet they weren't even halfway to the tree. In this situation, there was no choice but to order the Echo to attack, hoping that it could stall the giant monster. That way, of course, Sonny was putting his scavenger at risk. But there was no other choice. Just as he was about to reach the crest of the hill, the Echo tried to hide itself beneath the carapace demon's massive body. It was doing the same thing that Nephi's had done when fighting the first carapace centurion, intending to use the size of the enemy against it. The difference was that this time, the smaller participant of the fight was clad in a sturdy carapace, as opposed to a squishy human girl who had no protection. Even if the demon tried to crush the scavenger with its weight, it wouldn't be able to kill it. However, the demon understood it too. Moving with incredible speed, he shifted his torso and struck out with a pincer. The scavenger was swatted away like an irritating insect, flying through the air and heavily crashing onto the ground. Its carapace had almost cracked. Running toward the great tree, Sonny grimaced. He wanted to dismiss the echo, but knew that it was too soon. They needed more time. Ahead of him, Nephi's was already approaching the enormous black trunk. Not wasting any time, she removed the seaweed rucksack from her back, gently laid it on the ground, and began climbing, grabbing onto the cracks of the onyx bark. Meanwhile, the echo was shakily rising to its legs. A stubborn light was burning in its eyes. Producing a loud screech, it clacked its pincers in the air and once again rushed toward the demon. Go get him, buddy. Sonny screamed inwardly, wishing his scavenger luck with all his heart. The smaller creature bravely ran toward the steel behemoth, raising its pincers to attack. It was followed by two shadows, one bestial, the other one human. Sonny was quickly shortening the distance to the great tree. Below the hill, the carapace demon calmly stepped toward the rushing enemy. Its four arms moved in unison. Suddenly, the scavenger's arms were sliced off. Its body was gripped in two giant pincers and raised into the air. Sonny didn't even have time to react. A fraction of a second later, the demon slightly strained its arms and tore the echo in two, separating its torso from the carapace and crushing both halves into a bloody pulp. On top of the hill, Sonny stumbled. The familiar voice resounded like a tolling bell in his ears. Your echo has been destroyed.